Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Oops. Yes, that would be great. We have it up on our TV and on I, my phone. I am live. Okay. <laughs> Except it's uh, at least on my phone not working. Good morning, Mountain View Assembly of God. We are uh, trying something completely different. And uh, so you're going to see me live from uh, our home. And then after Sunday school at 1030, we'll transition to Pastor Dan at his home. So hopefully that will all work. We are live on Facebook, live on the Mountain View Assembly of God. And we are also live on YouTube. Uh, just real quick, what we're trying to do is we're going to be transitioning to uh, the church will have its own YouTube channel starting uh, really probably sometime today. And so from uh, this forward, we'll be, we are also looking at our website. We have lost our original website. At the end of my uh, Sunday school lesson, I'll give you some information we're not live yet with, but it should be live here in the next couple of days, and we actually will be able to embed our uh, YouTube live uh, broadcast, and we'll also get you some you know, doing this in the long term, because uh, it just seems to be uh, a good tool for reaching those that can't make it to church and that sort of thing. So. Um, so it's March 29th of April, and um, we are still, uh, well, we're just really half a week into this uh, stay-at-home order, and looks like we might. So that's kind of why we're working real hard to uh, put together some uh, ways that we can connect, and that's uh, important because as a church family, we need to do that. So I have um, plenty... Uh, 
to go over and uh, we should just get right into it. And so I'm going to switch over to uh, PowerPoint. You'll still see me, but uh, the PowerPoint will be the main page. There we are. So we are continuing to work through A.W. Tozer's book, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy. And um, I just wanted to maybe uh, give a, uh, oops, so, yep, I got lots of things I got to do here at the same time. Okay. I'm going to use my uh, clicker just like at church because I'm trying to stay as similar as I can. Normal's good. So um, A.W. Tozer, for those of you who may be just joining us now, uh, he lived um, from, well, he was born in 1897, so he goes way back, and he uh, passed away in 1963, so a couple of years before I was born. Um, he spent 44 years of ministry at the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church and uh, has written over 40 books and two uh, of them are the most uh, popular and I uh, recommend them highly both. One, the first one would be The Pursuit of God and the second one is this one that we are working through ourselves, The Knowledge of the Holy, which is really about God's attributes and most of um, A.W. Tozer's ministry had a lot to do with connecting with God in a deeper uh, way. And I, this is why it's something that I, I, I probably repeat this too often, but it's something that is good to return to every now and then. Just to remind ourselves, and, and just so we don't become too comfortable with um, God, we, we have to remember that that uh, God deserves our worship and our adoration and, and our response to him should be one of awe and uh, wonder. And that's kind of what Tozer really emphasizes throughout the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And, and uh, one of the things he says that I, I think is so uh, key is, is this statement. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And that is, I think, uh, a fundamental truth. And that's kind of what we've been trying to do over these last several months in, in talking about God's attributes is, is having a way of thinking rightly about God, as Tozer says. Um, so uh, just like last week, here's what we have been going through. Uh, we started with the, the mystery of the Trinity, three in one. And then we moved on to golf. God is self-existent. He's self-sufficient. He's eternal, he's infinite, he's immutable or unchanging, he is omniscient or all-knowing, he's all-powerful. Uh, you need to be an all-powerful God, right, if you're going to create the universe. Uh, he is all-present, he's omnipresent, he's faithful. And what a great comfort, you know, right in, this, uh, in the middle of this pandemic, isn't it comforting that God is faithful? And, and right after that, uh, Tozer goes into the idea that he is good. And we, we talked about the idea that God's goodness is running after us, is the, the song that we hear uh, Bethel sing. Um, he's running after us, his goodness is. And then a couple of Sunday, Sundays ago, we looked at the fact that he is just. And um, right on the heels of that, last week, we looked at the fact that he's also merciful. What a beautiful, you know, and again, it was no coincidence that uh, Tozer put these two concepts of God's character side by side because they, we have to understand both of them. And, and you know, what we've been returning to is the idea that in America today, we like to hear about God's mercy and today's topic is His grace. And we love to hear that because it brings us great comfort, but we also have to... Uh, weigh that or balance that out with the fact that God is still just. The reason that Christ died on the cross was because he, there was justice that had to be made, right? So that's part of uh, this whole idea. And, and, and while these are, again, fundamental concepts, um, it's, it's good to remind ourselves about these things from time to time. And that's what we're doing. So last week, when we were looking at the mercy of God, uh, we were... Uh, I started out, and I want to do the same thing. Uh, Tozer starts this chapter in, in words that, in my mind, are so eloquent that you can't really improve on them. So I'd like to just do that. It starts out like this. 
He says, when through the blood of the everlasting covenant, we children of the shadows reach at last our home in the light, we shall have a thousand strings to our harps. He goes, but the sweetest may well be the one tuned to sound forth most perfectly the mercy of God. What a wonderful thought. And you know, there's, there is going to come a day when we're going to get to play that string. And, and I, I, I can't imagine, I just imagine that we're going to want to say, can I play it again, Lord? Can I play it again? So he goes on, for what right will we have to be there? Did we not by our sins take part in that unholy rebellion, which rashly sought to dethrone the glorious King? Of creation and did we not he says in times past walk according to the course of this world according to the evil prince of the power of the air the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience and he continues and did we not all at once live in the lust of our flesh and were we not he goes on by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. And then he turns the page and he goes, But we who were one time enemies and alienated in our minds through wicked works shall then see God face to face, and his name shall be in our foreheads. We who earned banishment shall enjoy communion. Amen. And we who deserve the pains of hell shall know the bliss of heaven. And we get to play that string. And all through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. And really that just so, I think, eloquently sums up what reminding ourselves of God's mercy is all about. And then he finishes with a quote from Joseph Addison. He says, When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view, I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. And again, as we just kind of remind ourselves and as we kind of review this idea of mercy, this is what I hope we are doing, that we can stand back and pause for a moment. I mean, again, I, one of the things about uh, this whole pandemic is, is it gives us a chance really to, to set some serious time aside and let God be God in our lives. And let's stop and, and, and survey the mercy of God and let it transport us into wonder, love, and praise. So we looked at um, the idea, the def uh, legal sense of the word mercy means a defendant having been found guilty uh, 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 of a capital crime may ask for mercy or clemency, right? From being executed. Clemency means the disposition to be merciful and especially to moderate the severity of punishment due. That's what you and I have been receiving is mercy. We, we looked at the verse in Psalms 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd Psalms, and verse 6 says, Surely goodness, and what? In the New King James, and the King James, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In other versions, it's loving kindness and compassion instead of mercy. And we were trying to say, you know, the, the legal definition is one thing, but really what's behind mercy is God's compassion and his loving kindness. And you'll see those, those words used often instead of the word mercy. Uh, we looked at the idea of compassion, that the word is, it means, um, compassion or kindly forbearance shown toward an offender, an enemy or other person in one's power. And there's again is the word compassion, pity, or benevolence. And, you know, just going back to this idea of, uh, of um, a defendant, guess what? This is what we talked about. 
we, you and I, are the defendant. We're guilty, right? We're guilty, except for the grace and mercy of God. And, and um, as a defendant, we have been granted clemency. And again, clemency is a word that means mercy. That is what we've been given. We looked at some scriptures real quick. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Uh, Paul says, And you, who were dead in trespasses and sin. That's who we were before Christ, right? But I left out a part. Because he preceded that by saying this. And you, he made alive. That's God's mercy working on us because we've gone from dead in trespasses and sin to being alive in Christ. And so Tozer said, mercy is an attribute of God. It's part of his character. He says, an infinite and inexhaustible energy within the divine nature which disposes God to be actively compassionate. And that should be great comfort to us, should it not? And, and when we're in the grips of, of, of pain and, and grief and sorrow, we should remember God's mercy. And, and, and that's one of the concepts we were sort of asking is that when we cry out to God for mercy, like Bartimaeus did when he was seeking Christ to, 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 to see, he, he was seeking his mercy. Son of David, have mercy on me. We also looked at the idea that it's not just a New Testament uh, uh, thing. It was also... Uh, Old Testament, in fact, we said that in the Old Testament, it's actually used four times more than in the New Testament. It's just in the New Testament, it's something that is developed in much broader terms. But one of the funnest and the best part I liked about this is his mercy is for us. It's for us. Just like his goodness is running towards us, his mercy is for us. And we looked at some examples of that and we see where Tozer says, to receive to receive mercy, you and I must do something. And that's exactly kind of what we've been doing in Sunday school in the last uh, several months is we must first know that God is merciful. We, not, we need to know it. It needs to be uh, the rock beneath our feet so that there's not sinking sand, but the rock of his mercy is always right there with us. And he goes on. And it is not enough to believe that he showed mercy to Noah or Abraham or David and will again show mercy in, in some happy future day. It's, that's not good enough, he says. He goes, we must believe that God's mercy is boundless, free and through Jesus Christ our Lord, available to us now in our present situation. I don't know about you, but that gives me great comfort. And that's something that, again, it's just, it's needful to remind ourselves of how great God's mercy is. And that brings us to this morning's topic, God's amazing grace. What do you think about that? I mean, when we think about God and think about his grace, what's the first thing that just enters into your mind? Just pause for a moment and think about God's grace. Doesn't it give you a calming in your soul deep down? Amen. So one of the things I, I mentioned to just briefly here was we looked at uh, Mark 10 and, and this story of Bartimaeus. And it says, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. They told him to shut up, basically, right? But he cried out all the more. I just love this. This is what we our attitude should be for God is we need that kind of mercy every day, don't we? So he said, cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And then we see in verses 49 through 51, And when Jesus heard him, because he's going to hear us, amen? He stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So everybody changed from being kind of rude to being friendly and saying, so they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. 
So Bartimaeus threw aside his coat and jumped up and came to Jesus. And, and Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, teacher, the blind man said, I want to see. He cried out for mercy. He cried out for God's mercy to be able to see. And then the favor of God was granted to him and he received his sight. We see mercy and grace peeking out together. I'm reminded of the song that we used to sing a lot more. We still probably sing it on occasion. Uh, it's by Julia Johnson. It was written in 1911. Grace, grace, God's grace, right? Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. This is a good time to say, wow. God, your grace is so great. Well, what I wanted to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is go a little deeper into the song and look at some of the chorus, or not the choruses, but this, uh, the, the verses. It, it goes, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount poured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Breathe it in. Breathe it in, please, this morning. Let it grip your soul. The second verse says, Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. We can avail to wash it away. Or in what can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, brighter than snow you may be today. And then the third goes marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, you that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive. Amen. Such power. Such power. Let's look at some definitions about God's amazing grace grace um the most the one that we see the most often and and um it's a very simple one two words it equals unmerited favor you cannot do anything to earn it it's the favor of god showered on you for no other purpose than god's loving kindness and compassion just like his mercy Let's look at Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Verse 4, but, and I love it, whenever there's a but, there's something powerful coming. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, there's those two words again, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, we can't earn it, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. And then there's verse 6. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then comes the coup de grace. Verse 7. Because of His grace, He declared you and I righteous and gave us confidence that we 
will inherit eternal life. These things go way beyond the temporal moment that we are living in right now. Is as weird as it is and as out of the norm as it's been, this is just a tiny blip in eternity. And that is what God has promised us through his grace. And that's what we want to remind ourselves this morning. So Tozer says, in continuing this idea of what grace is, grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon you and I, the undeserving. Amen? And so one of the things is, it's interesting, mercy and grace, some people describe mercy and grace as being different sides of the same coin. On the one side of the coin is, is grace or unmerited favor. And on the flip side of that coin is mercy and unmerited clemency. Tozer says, in God, mercy and grace are one. But as they reach us, they are seen as two. This is why it's good just to look at the differences between the two. Related, but not identical, he says. As mercy is God's goodness, confronting human misery and guilt. So, he says, grace is his goodness directed towards human debt and demerit. So on the one side, mercy has commuted the sentence that you and I have come under, right? For God to serve justice upon those who are, are disobedient. And then on the other time, side of it, not only did he commute our sentence, but he made his heirs to the kingdom. There, that is so, un, uh, it's, it's beyond words, right? It's beyond words. And so that's why we're talking about it this, merc this morning. So again, mercy is God's compassion, keeping us from the punishment we deserve. It declares us not guilty. Grace, on the other hand, is God's favor canceling the debt we owe from our transgression of the law. And this is Tozer speaking. And it is more. It grants us kinship in his family, the riches of heaven. And it is still more. It's life everlasting and the Holy Spirit <laughs> and it is still more because all of it gives him good pleasure so you and I have gone from paupers to sons of the king because of his grace in Ephesians 1 5 Paul talks about this. His unchanging plan has always, always, always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Now, I forgot to mention, we're uh, spending two Sundays on this topic. We're going to just go through half of this today, and the next Sunday we'll uh, finish this off. So, what we want to now is just kind of turn a corner and talk a little bit about grace and the law. Again, just thinking about uh, we like to hear things that are like grace, right? We, we love to hear about God's love. We love the fact that God has given us this eternal life. And, and But that doesn't say his justice is being put on a back burner. In fact, without grace, there cannot be justness. And that is the whole purpose why Christ came to earth and died on the cross. And, and so uh, we spent quite a bit of this uh, because Paul spends quite a bit of uh, his time in the book of Romans dealing with this very topic. And uh, we did Romans, uh, oh, a year or so ago, and, and we dealt with this in quite a uh, bit. But we just want to talk a little bit about this. Grace... Uh, 
in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We just kind of want to compare those two and see what they look like. Uh, when we're doing that, what we're talking about is a word called dispensationalism. Dispensation means a general state or order of things. So uh, in the Old Testament, there was one dispensation. And today in the New Testament, we're living in a new one. So um, there was the dispensation of law in the Old Testament. And secondly, now what we're, you and I are living in is the dispensation of grace. Uh, and that's what Jesus said. Well, excuse me, dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom because we are living in the kingdom it's invisible now there will be one day when it is no longer invisible and that's a that's the third dispensation but in this one jesus talks about in john 1 17 or well actually this is the writer john talking about it for the law was given through moses right in the former dispensation but grace and truth through jesus christ and that's this dispensation that we're living in so Tozer talks about this by saying, but right here, he says, it is easy to miss the path and go far astray from the truth. And some have done this. And this is talking about, and, and I, what's interesting to me is uh, Tozer wrote this book in the late 50s. And it is just more so applicable today than it was back then. And so he goes on. They have, oops, sorry. They have compelled this verse to stand by itself unrelated to other scriptures bearing on the doctrine of grace and made it teach that Moses knew only law and Christ only knows grace and that's not true but let's go back it let's take a quick look at Moses and the law we'll look at um, Exodus chapter 34 and we're gonna read verses 5 through 9 it says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and, and uh, proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, what is he saying? Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. He goes on in verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's his mercy. By no means clearing the guilt. See, he's by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses, it says, made haste and bowed his head toward the earth. And worshiped that's our only that's really when you come down to it that's our only response isn't it so verse 9 then he said if now I have found what grace in your sight O Lord let my Lord I pray go among us even though we are a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin. And here's his grace in full color. And take us as your inheritance. That's Moses and grace. Amen. So we see the law of Moses. And, and that stands in stark contrast to God's grace. But what we want to do is we want to look at the law of Christ. Because that is in the dispensation that we are living in. And what is the law of Christ? Well, it's moral principles that are eternal and are, in, are summed up in what Jesus said. And here it is in full, uh, in full armor, Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question testing him and saying teacher which is the great commandment in the law and what did jesus say in verse 37 he said you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind with everything in other words this is the first and great commandment 
That's a pretty powerful law right there. Would you not agree? And he doesn't leave it there. He says, and the second is like it. Oops, sorry. Uh, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And therein lies verse 42. Because on these two commandments hang what? All, not some, all the law and the prophets. So again, in God's grace, all the laws and the prophets are caught up in it. But there's just a way, a difference in how these two work in our lives. Old Testament versus New. And we're going to um, dive deeper into that as, as we go. So what I want to do is just finish up. I came across an, uh, this infographic uh, on uh, teaching uh, on a website, and I thought it was kind of interesting. And so I thought it would be good for us just to kind of walk through this because it, it shows the differences of about the application of the law versus the application of grace. So the first one says you rel when it comes to the law, you rely on yourself to be right with God or for righteous living, right? You, there's all these laws that you have to follow. And, and if you uh, disobey one of them, you basically have broken the law, right? And so uh, that's how the law, it's, it's pretty uh, black and white. Grace, on the other hand, on the blue side, says you, um, you rely on Jesus' righteousness. And I don't know about you, but Oh, that feels, you mean, is it true? Yes, it's true. That's how we are right with God. Uh, we see this in Romans chapter 3. Or uh, if you want to look it up also, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So the next one is, and I, I find this to be kind of interesting. I never had thought about this. It, it says 3,000 people died when the law was introduced. And I'll talk about that for a second. And then on the blue side, under grace, 3,000 people joined the church, right? When Peter preached his first sermon. And that was on the day of Pentecost. And, and 3,000 believers uh, came into the church on that day. Uh, in talking about the law, well, what was happening when Moses was up on the mount and, and God was giving him the Ten Commandments? Chaos, right? Sin disobedience, uh, lawlessness. Um, and as Moses came down, he found the camp worshiping these, this bull, uh, uh, this calf. And um, so the whole idea is, is that out of that, God said, every man shall, you know, take a sword. And, and there was 3,000 people that died that day. Interesting. The next one is, when it comes to the law, you must behave before you belong. What's the one that I was thinking about? Circumcision, right? If you wanted to join, you had to be circumcised. Uh, versus, in, and, and this was something that the early church got caught up in a lot, right? And so, um, you must behave before you belong. On the grace side, you belong and your behavior will change. And this is one of the things, this is kind of the nugget that you begin to see where... Um, when grace inundates your soul, outflows obedience, outflows a desire to follow and, and do the first and second commandments that Jesus said are that the whole law and prophets are going to. We, we see this in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, if you want to uh, just, again, see what Paul had to say about that. Next, we have the law magnifies sin. And again, if you go back to Romans, you're going to see Paul talking about that. How, how you know, I didn't know what sin was until the law told me I couldn't do something. And then suddenly my lust rages up inside of me and I want to do it, right? So it, it, it emphasizes the fact of sin. Grace, on the other hand, don't you love it? Magnifies forgiveness. There's great power in that, amen? And that is, that is uh, we are so lucky, 
We're so lucky. And, and so some scripture references, if you want to look at the way the law magnifies sin, look in Romans chapter 5, verses, verse 15, and also Romans chapter 6, verse 19. And on the other side, look at Acts 2, verse 48. This is part of Peter's sermon. And also uh, Acts 13, 38. This is what was preached. This is the good news of the gospel, that there's forgiveness of sins. Amen. The last one was... And this is interesting. This is uh, another beautiful difference between the law and grace. On the one side, the law instructs. And this is, again, this is very consistent with how Paul taught in Romans. Uh, it, it instructs how to live a fulfilling and healthy life. And, and uh, you'll see that Paul uh, looks at that in Romans 7. Grace, on the other hand, doesn't just empower. It, it doesn't instruct. It empowers. It gives you the tools. The Holy Spirit has been given to you and I to empower us to live a fulfilling and healthy life. That's powerful all by itself, isn't it? So that is where we're at on March 29th. Um, it, I have 10.08. I think that um, by the time, I think there's a bit of a lag in, in our video, so you'll probably, this will end right around 10.15. Um, it's been great uh sharing with you sorry it's been kind of uh, hit and miss uh, this is all new to me as well um let me switch back to myself and happy birthday well it looks like i'm locked up um yeah, which is happy. not I, I suspicion you can still hear me so what i'm going to just get, do is give you a little bit of instruction um our website I wonder if that can, I'll, I'll bring that up. And I'm just going to show you um, what our address is going to be uh, as soon as it goes live. And I got to find the right. Now it should be showing up. Um, it is Mountain View, all one word, Mountain View AG 